publishing. And we're very, very excited. Um, she led a great master class yesterday. She's been kind of meeting people over time. So um, this is the culminating event. Tomorrow night she'll be at the ICA. So um, if you're around, go check that out. Uh, and uh, so just a little bit of housekeeping. We are live streaming this event. So you are being live streamed. Um, and it'll be available once the event is over at HowlRound.com. It's part of HowlRound TV. Lives inside the Office of the Arts. If you don't know the website, check it out. And also, in case of an emergency, exits are located there and there. Please go down the stairs and peacefully away from the building. All right, and so now I'm going to hand it over to Kimberly McLaren of Writing Literature and Publishing to get this started. Thank you all for being here. I won't be the microphone. Uh, I just want to say, um, I just wanted to uh, say that we're really excited to work with the off, uh, Office of Arts and Arts Emerson as part of uh, our uh, WLPC, uh, WLP Leadership. Sorry, it's been a long semester. <laughs> a long <laughs> semester. Um, I just wanted to give you a heads up that uh, for our part, for WLP, this is an annual reading series, and this year we've had an extraordinary year ending on a high note. Um, we began with Jeffrey Renard Allen, we had the poet Richard Blanco, we had Roxane Gay, which was a really great experience, and now we have Claudia Rankin. And I want to have you keep in mind that we're going to be bringing in uh, in some more talented poets, writers, um, uh, essayists next year. I can announce that we're bringing in Teju Cole, Teju Cole? Teju Cole, which is very exciting. And also we're bringing in uh, Michael Cunningham. And, and we have two others that we're, on, that we're constantly uh, currently negotiating with. So uh, please keep an eye out for the posters and the and the um, newsletters and come and take part of this reading series, experience these writers, poets, essayists, playwrights who are working at the top of their game and coming here to interact with you, Emerson students, and with the members of the public. So if you have, if you're not on our mailing list, please get on our mailing list so that you will be informed. Um, I want to thank uh, the Office of the Arts for this extraordinary time, uh, Fresh Sound Foundation, um, um, and especially David Bauer. Um, I want to thank uh, Maria Condor, the chair of WLP, and um, Ross Ball, the dean of the School of the Arts, and everyone for all their support. And I'd like to introduce uh, my colleague, Wendy, Wendy Walters, who's going to introduce our guest speaker reader for tonight. Um, we'd like to, uh, Wendy is an extraordinary scholar and um, well-versed in Ms. Rankin's work, and I thought it would be appropriate for her to do the introduction. Uh, Dr. Wendy Walter specializes in African American literature. She teaches here, obviously, and in, in, in the larger context of diaspora studies. She's the author of Archives of the Black Atlantic, Reading Between Literature and History, and At Home in Diaspora, Black International Writing. She has been a non-resident fellow at the Du Bois Institute at Harvard University and has published articles in Callaroo, American Literature, African American Review, Novel, Critical Arts, and many other publications. She published chapters in the books Borders, Exiles, Diasporas, and Diasporic, Diasporic Africa, a Reader, as well as has entries in the Oxford Companion to African American Literature, Black Writers, and the Critical Response to Chester Hines. Wendy is uh, an extraordinary scholar, a great colleague, and a great mentor and friend, and I'm pleased to introduce her. Thank you. In this introduction by noting the powerful student protests that occurred yesterday at Emerson. We all witnessed and took part in a courageous and saddening reminder that the past and the present are not so distinct. Any of my students in the room will recognize when I quote Ian Bauckham's Specters of the Atlantic and say, time does not pass, it accumulates. When I think of the affronts insults and exclusions students have been talking about since I came to Emerson back at the turn of the last century. It saddens me to know that today's students who are only in kindergarten back in 1999 are still facing the same affronts, insults, and exclusions. The language has not passed, it has accumulated. I had to leave yesterday's protest to meet a student who's working on an Afrofuturist story about Rosewood, Florida a thriving black community that was leveled, burned to the ground by white mobs in 1923. 
In her research into Rosewood's history, though, my student has found that the reporting about Rosewood in 1923 shares the same language as reporting about Ferguson in 2014 and now Baltimore in 2015. The language has not passed, it has accumulated. Who better to turn to when we seek to understand this accumulation of language than a poet? How does this painful accumulation of language continue to shape the world in which we live? Claudia Rankin's poetry asks this question repeatedly, and her work teaches us the myriad ways that language matters. Her book, Citizen and American Lyric, won the National Book Critics Circle Award for Poetry and was the first book ever to be named a finalist in both the poetry and criticism categories. A judge from the NBCC Poetry Committee wrote, Citizen uses the realm of the lyric to critique the terms by which we live. In Citizen, our bodies and our racial selves are not isolated or even present tense, but also communal, unconscious, historical. Indeed, the specters of the Atlantic return in multiple ways in Citizen, as the violence of past centuries continues to haunt our present. Claudia Rankin writes, quote, yours is a strange dream, a strange reverie. No, it's a strange beach. Each body is a strange beach. And if you let in the excess emotion, you will recall the Atlantic Ocean breaking on our heads. Citizen's final two pages depict a famous 19th century painting, which happens to be in the Museum of Fine Arts just down the road from here, J.M.W. Turner's slave ship. As you may know, the painting depicts the 18th century slave ship Dom after the captain and crew threw into the sea 132 living African captives. Claudia Rankin's reproduction of the painting portrays the entire painting with ship in background, and then next to it, a second image, the foreground of the painting, depicting the humans thrown overboard as she implores us to attend to this drowning. Perhaps this excess emotion called up by the memory of drowning in the Atlantic is again, as it was in the 18th century, a righteous rage. <coughs> In section six of Citizen, Claudia Rankins presents the poetry of one of our contemporary archives, CNN, on August 29, 2005, during Hurricane Katrina. Is the government's lack of response to that storm originating at sea another more recent deliberate drowning? She writes, quote, have you seen their faces? We are drowning here, still in the difficulty." Unquote. Poetry is one of the places we turn to find a way to communicate the difficulty we are still in, to rescue each other from drowning in it. Citizen holds the distinction of being the only poetry book to be a New York Times bestseller in the nonfiction category, and it was a finalist for the National Book Award long listed for the Penn Open Book Award and was selected as an NPR Best Book of 2014. Claudia Rankin's other books of poetry are Don't Let Me Be Lonely, Plot, The End of the Alphabet, and Nothing in Nature is Private, and she's co-edited several anthologies. In 2014, she was a National Book Award finalist and received Poets and Writers Jackson Poetry Prize, and she's been awarded fellowships from the Academy of American Poets the National Endowment for the Arts, and the Lannan Foundation. It's my great honor and pleasure to introduce Claudia Rankin. Good evening. Um, it's, such, it's, it's been such a pleasure being here. I, I want to thank Wendy and Kim and David and Polly and and you, um, for being here. I, um, I thought that tonight I would do something a little different than what I have been doing. So um, we, worked, this is, we worked on a video for you, my husband and I, 
And so I thought we would start by showing um, two videos that are in Citizen and in New York. So that will take about 15 minutes, and then I will leave. On the train, the woman standing makes you understand there are no seats available. And in fact, there is one. Is the woman getting off at the next stop? No, she would rather stand all the way to Union Station. The space next to the man is a pause in a conversation you are suddenly rushing to fill. You step quickly over the woman's fear, a fear she shares. You let her have it. The man doesn't acknowledge you as you sit down because the man knows more about the unoccupied seat than you do. For him, you imagine it is more like breath than wonder. He has had to think about it so much, he wouldn't call it thought. When another passenger leaves his seat and the standing woman sits, you glance over at the man. He is gazing out the window into what looks like darkness. You sit next to the man on the train, bus, in the plane, waiting room, anywhere he would be forsaken. You put your body there in proximity to, adjacent to, alongside with him. You don't speak unless you are spoken to and your body speaks to the space you fill, and you keep trying to fill it, except the space belongs to the body of the man next to you, not to you. Where he goes, the space follows him. If the man left his seat before Union Station, you would simply be a person in a seat on the train. You would cease to struggle against the unoccupied seat when, where, why the space won't lose its meaning. You imagine if the man spoke to you, he would say, it's okay, I'm okay. You don't need to sit here. You don't need to sit and you sit and look past him into the darkness. The train is moving through a tunnel. All the while, the darkness allows you to look at him. Does he feel you looking at him? You suspect so. What does suspicion mean? What does suspicion do? The soft gray green of your cotton coat touches the sleep of him. You are shoulder to shoulder, though standing you could feel shadowed. You sit to repair whom, whom. You erase that thought. And it might be too late for that. It might forever be too late or too early. The train moves too fast for your eyes to adjust to anything beyond the man, the window, the tile tunnel, its slick darkness. Occasionally a white light flickers by like a displaced sound. From across the aisle tracks room harbor world, a woman asks a man in the rows ahead if he would mind switching seats. She wishes to sit with her daughter or son. You hear, but you don't hear, you can't see. It's then the man next to you turns to you. And as if from inside your own head, you agree that if anyone asks you to move, you'll tell them. We are traveling as a family.
something is there before us that is neither the living person himself nor any sort of reality. Neither the same as the one who is alive nor another. What is there is the absolute calm of what has found its place. Every day I think about where I came from and I am still proud to be who I am. Big Algerian shit. Dirty terrorists, nigger, perhaps the most insidious and least understood form of segregation is that of the word. The Algerian men, for their part, are a target of criticism for their European comrades, arise directly to the level of tragedy. Notice too, Illustrations of this kind of racial prejudice can be multiplied indefinitely. Clearly, the Algerians, who in view of the intensity of the repression and the frenzied character of the oppression, thought they could answer the blows received without any serious problem of conscience. And there is no black who has not felt briefly or for long periods with anguish sharp or dull in varying degrees and to varying effect, simple, naked, and unanswerable hatred, who has not wanted to smash any white face he may encounter in a day, to violate out of motives of the cruelest vengeance, to break the bodies of all white people as low as the dust, into which he himself has been and is being trampled. No black who has not had to make his own precarious adjustment. Yet the adjustment must be made, rather it must be attempted. Do you think two minutes from the end of the World Cup final, two minutes from the end of my career, I wanted to do that. Each decision gave rise to the same hesitation, produced the same despair. No one is free. For all that he is, people will say, he remains for us an Arab. You can't get away from nature. Big Algerian shit, dirty terrorists, let him do his spite. My services, which I have done, shall out-tongue his complaints. When such things happen, he must grit his teeth, walk away a few steps, elude the passerby who draws attention to him, who gives other passers-by the desire either to follow the example or to come to his defense. Big Algerian shit, dirty terrorists, Nigger, that man who is forced each day to snatch his manhood, his identity, out of the fire of human cruelty that rages to destroy it, knows something about himself and human life that no school on earth, and indeed no church, can teach. He achieves his own authority, and that is unshakable. This is because in order to save his life, he is forced to look beneath appearances, to take nothing for granted, to hear the meaning behind the words. We hear, then we remember. The state of emergency is also always a state of emergence. But at this moment, from whence came the spirit I don't know. I resolved to fight. And suiting my action to the resolution, what we have here is not the bringing to light of a character known and frequented a thousand times in the imagination or in stories. It is the white man who creates the black man, but it is the black man who creates. This thing was there. We grasp it in the living motion. What he said touched 
the deepest part of me. The rebuttal assumes an original form. This endless struggle to achieve and reveal and confirm a human identity, human authority, contains, for all its horror, something very beautiful. Daily, we share the same elevators, streets, corridors, stairways, sidewalks, highways, arenas, restrooms, lobbies, subways. In short, all public spaces. Even when access is gained by a ticket, the true price of the ticket is dependent on an implicit trust. The understood question is always, can I trust you? We signal indicating our desire to change lanes on the freeway. We cross streets without stop signs by catching the eye of the driver in the moving car. We drift off in waiting areas. We are dreaming on planes. We depend on those around us to keep us safe. This is our unspoken agreement between us, between strangers. Our civic contract states, we will act in each other's best interest for no other reason than we are here together. Beaver Creek 911, where's your emergency? I'm at the uh, Beaver Creek Walmart. There's a uh, gentleman walking around with a gun in the store. Is he got it pulled out? Yeah, he's like pointing at people. What does he look like? He's a black male, probably about six foot tall. Okay, what's he wearing? Um, blue shirt, blue pants. The alliance we pledged is to one another. Assurance is taken. Can I trust you? Assurance is taken. Different from and similar to each other. Whatever the precise thinking behind the question, the question is asked deep within us. We recognize that inevitably, I am going to have to put my trust in you. We are circling the understanding that daily we have to take a leap of faith regarding you. In order that we can go on believing in our mobility, Trust is what pledging an allegiance secures. Public trust relies on both an implicit understanding and a mode of seeing. Someone is paying attention. Someone is watching. See. Oh, oh shit. Oh shit. If you see something, say something, because we will trust you. Peace of mind gives us the ability to move through our day without fear. It keeps us in our rhythms. It gives us an air of confidence regarding an illusory control of the world around us. We drift off in waiting areas. We are dreaming on planes. We understand what will happen next. 
and this is crucial to a sense of well-being, even if this control is no control at all. When something occurs that disallows the taking for granted of one's own safety, when something happens, when that thing happens. So what's your business with me right now? I want to find out who you are. There is no problem, that's the thing. So talk to me, let me know and let who you are. know. Why do I have to let you know who I am to let who I am isn't because the problem? That's what police do when they get called well, I don't have to let you. People. Well, I know my rights. First off, secondly, okay. secondly, okay. I don't have to let you know who I am if I haven't broken any laws. I told, like I told him, I'm going to New Horizons to pick up my kids at ten o'clock. I was sitting there for ten minutes, fully, okay. like not before he walked up to me or anything. He walked up to me a minute after and got irate with me. So first off, that's a public area. And if there's no sign that doesn't say this is a private area, you can't sit here, no one can tell me I can't sit here. If that's the case, then I can't sit here. There is no, the problem is I'm black. That's the problem. No, it really is, because I didn't do anything wrong. I'm not sitting there with a group of people. I'm sitting there by myself. Walking by. Okay. Radio's called on that subject, uh, the Walking by and doing what? So you're making people nervous. By walking by? Yeah, they said you had your hands in your pockets. Wow, walking by having your hands in your pockets makes people nervous to call the police when it's snowing outside? It is. Okay. So are you okay? I'm fine. How about you? I'm good. All right. What are you up to today? Walking with my hands in my pockets, walking. We might find discomfort in a loss of comfort. We might lose an ease of movement around another. The perceived inability to trust another. No one wishes his or her sense of trust violated. Each time we pass through our public spaces, the question presents as a gentle nudge against an unconscious reliance on public trust. Would you, could you, should you trust? We are dozing in airports. We are dreaming on planes. As we daily move through our streets, in our parks, across bridges, in the aisles of stores, anywhere and everywhere we live, a simple truth and a basic understanding exists. When I walk toward you, it's one of the reasons I'm interested in. As we turn to each other, it's one of the reasons I'm interested in. Each second inside our unspoken question is one of the reasons I'm interested in. I trust you. My brothers are notorious. They have not been to prison. They have been in prison. The prison is not a place you enter. It is no place. My brothers are notorious. 
they do regular things like wait on my birthday they say my name they will never forget that we are named what is that memory the days of our childhood together were steep steps into a collapsing mind it looked like we rescued ourselves were rescued then there are these days each day of our adult lives they will never forget our way through these brothers each brother my brother dear brother my dearest brothers dear heart your hearts are broken this is not a secret though there are secrets and as yet i do not understand how my own sorrow has turned into my brother's hearts the hearts of my brothers are broken if i knew another way to be i would call up a brother i would hear myself saying my brother dear brother my dearest brothers dear hearts on the tip of a tongue one note following another is another path another dawn where the pink sky is the bloodshot of struck of sleepless of sorry of senseless shush those years of and before me and my brothers the years of passage plantation migration of jim crow segregation of poverty inner cities profiling of one in three two jobs boy hey boy each a felony accumulate into the hours inside our lives where we are all caught hanging the rope inside us the tree inside us its roots our limbs a throat sliced through and when we open our mouth to speak blossoms oh blossoms no place coming out brother dear brother that kind of blue the sky is the silence of brothers all the days leading up to my call if i call that say goodbye before i broke the goodbye i say goodbye before anyone can hang up don't hang up my brother hangs up though he's there i keep talking the talk keeps them there the sky is blue kind of blue the day is hot is it cold are you cold it does get cool is it cool are you cool my brother is completed by sky the sky is a silence eventually he says it is raining it is raining down it was raining it stopped raining it is raining down he won't hang up he's there he's there but he's hung up though he's there goodbye i say i break the goodbye i say goodbye before anyone can hang up don't hang up wait with me wait with me though the waiting might be the call of goodbyes i wonder if i can just well he went away <laughs> now he's coming back to save me i just want to get that to Um, that piece in the book is followed by this, what I just read. Um, I, this was the most difficult image to, to get the rights to use because initially the Fulton Archives said no, they said you can't have it. And um, because they were afraid of what people would do with it. Basically, we hang the more people, images, you know, through the image. And um, so we called another day, hoping for another person. <laughs> <laughs> and so this other person said um, that they would agree to read the book. And so they agreed to read the book, and then they gave us permission. And so I was nervous to actually ask them if I could remove the bodies. But I said, can we remove the bodies? They said, sure. Because that was the point of contention. That was the thing that gave them anxiety. So we removed the bodies because I was only interested in this, in complicity 
in whiteness around white supremacist action. Um, but they were like, oh, that's it. So that's in the, in the text. It's the lynching of um, Thomas Schiff and Abram Smith, August 7th, 1937, in Marion, Indiana. So it looks like Indiana was preparing itself for a long time for its recent activity. Since I'm in Boston, I thought I would read this, which um, was inspired by Robert Lowell. Sometimes, I is supposed to hold what is not there until it is. Then what is comes apart the closer you are to it. This makes the first person a symbol for something, the pronoun barely holding the person together. Someone claimed we should use our skin as wallpaper knowing we wouldn't win. You said, I has so much power, it's insane. And you would look past me all gloved up in a big coat and fancy fur around the collar and record itself saying, you should be scared. The first person can't pull you together. Shiv, you're reading minds. But did you try? Tried rhyme? Tried truth? Tried epistolary untruth? Tried and tried. You really did. Everyone understood you to be suffering, and still everyone thought you thought you were the sun. Never mind our unlikeness. You too have heard the noise in your voice. Anyway, sit down. Sit here alongside. Exactly why we survive and can look back with furrowed brow is beyond me. It is not something to know. Your ill-spirited, cooked, hell on Main Street, nobody's here, broken down first person could be one of many definitions of being to pass on. The past is a life sentence, a blunt instrument aimed at tomorrow. Drag that first person out of the social death of history, then we're kin. Kin calling out the past like a foreigner with a newly minted fuck you. Maybe you don't agree. Maybe you don't think so. Maybe you're right. You don't really have anything to confess. Why are you standing? Listen, you. I was creating a life study of a monumental first person, a Brahmin first person. If you need to feel that way. Still, you are here in here and here is nowhere. Join me down here in nowhere. Don't lean against the wallpaper. Sit down and pull together. Yours is a strange dream, a strange reverie. No, it's a strange beach. Each body is a strange beach. And if you let in the excess emotion, you will recall the Atlantic Ocean breaking on our heads. I wanted to read that for you. <coughs> and I'll show you the image she referenced. That's the Turner that you own in your lips. A 
strong and that's the um, detail of the valley. Do you know that Ruskin was the first person to own this? And when it was first shown, there was a poem that went along with it. I've always loved Turner, because he's so moody. I feel like I see a reflection in myself. <laughs> the, the question that I asked many people um, while I was working on this book was, um, can you tell me a moment when you were moving along in your day and um, with a colleague, with a friend, um, and something happened that threw you out of that moment. And um, most of the stories that people remembered happening to them, I had an equivalent <coughs> story. So in that sense, it wasn't a surprise. But there was one story told to me by a professor in Northern California, and um, she's a good friend of mine. And I said, no way did that happen. She said, way. <laughs> <laughs> the new therapist specializes in trauma counseling. You have only ever spoken on the phone. Her house has a side gate that leads to a back entrance she uses for patients. You walk down a path bordered on both sides with deer grass and rosemary to the gate, which turns out to be locked. At the front door, the bell is a small round disc that you press firmly. When the door finally opens, the woman standing there yells at the top of her lungs, get away from my house, what are you doing in my yard? It's as if a wounded Doberman pincher or a German shepherd has gained the power of speech. And though you back up a few steps, you manage to tell her you have an appointment. You have an appointment, she spits back. Then she pauses, everything pauses. Oh, she says, followed by, oh yes, that's right, I'm sorry, I am so, so sorry. I asked my friend, what happened next? She went to the appointment. Way. <laughs> she went to the appointment and then I asked her what happened next and she said she went home and she wept and then she wrote a letter to the therapist saying I can't come back and I said so you made another appointment <laughs> but I totally understand her I say that without any judgment at all because I would have done exactly the same thing maybe I mean, now I wouldn't, but <laughs> at the time, I might have. I would have to walk into exactly the same scenario not to do the same thing. But it could present itself in another way where I could see myself just moving forward. You're in the dark, in the car, watching the black charred street being swallowed by speed. She tells you his dean is making him hire a person of color when there are so many great writers out there. You think maybe this is an experiment and you're being tested or retroactively insulted or you have done something that communicates this is an okay conversation to be having. Why do you feel comfortable saying this to me? You wish a light would turn red or a police siren would go off so you could slam on the brakes, slam into the car in the head of you, fly forward so quickly, both your faces would suddenly be exposed to the wind. As usual, you drive straight through the moment with the expected backing off of what was previously said. It is not only that confrontation is headache producing, it is also that you have a destination that doesn't include acting like this moment isn't inhabitable, hasn't happened before, and the before isn't part of the now, as the night darkens and the time shortens between where we are and where we are going. 
and I'm going to end. I want, actually, I wanted to show you, this is Kate Clark. Um, and um, I saw this image many, many years ago. And I, you know, our bodies are so incredible. I'm always marveled. Um, and it stored itself. And then I was working on Citizen. And I was just telling John, I was in um, Wyoming, Ute Cross. And I was sitting at my desk writing. And I was looking out the window. And there were a herd of deer. And I thought, I'm going to join them. <laughs> so I got up, and I went to the door. And the first click the door made meant that every face looked at me. So I thought, all right, I'm not going to join them. But um, when I sat back down, I began to think about the vigilance, the constant vigilance. And it suddenly, um, there was a moment of indwelling. There was a moment where I moved into that space. And then I remembered Kate's image. And so I tracked it down. And I contacted her and asked her if I could use it. And I sent her the text, which was a very early version of this. And she said, why? It's so painful. Um, let me make a new piece. You can commission an actual piece. So I got to choose the heart. And, and then she did a new face. And I said, I don't want it. Because what I had liked about the original why it stayed with me all that time was the affect in the eyes. And so I went back to the originals. But then I, since I had Kate for the right thing, <laughs> I, <laughs> I used that in the Racial Imaginary, which is a collection of essays on writing race and the imaginary. And I will end um, I just want to say before I read this, thank you all for coming. Yeah. Some years there exists a wanting to escape, you floating above your certain ache. Still the ache coexists. Call that the imminent you. You are you even before you grow into understanding you are not anyone, worthless, not worth you. Even as your own weight insists, you are here, fighting off the weight of non-existence. And still, thus, this life parts your lips. You see you seeing your extending hand as a falling wave. I, they, he, she, we, you turn only to discover the encounter to be alien to this place. Wait. The patience is in the living. Time opens out to you. The opening between you and you occupied, zoned for an encounter. Given the histories of you and you, and always, who is this you? The start of you, each day, a presence already. Hey you, slipping down, burying the you, buried within. You are everywhere and you are nowhere in the day. The outside comes in, then you, Hey you, overheard in the moonlight, overcome in the moonlight. Soon you're sitting around publicly listening when you hear this. What happens to you doesn't belong to you, only half concerns you. He's speaking of the legionnaires in Claire Denis' film, Beau Travail, and you are pulled back into the body of you receiving the nothing gaze the world out there insisting on this only half concerns you, 
What happens to you doesn't belong to you. Only half concerns you. It's not yours, not yours only. And still a world begins its furious erasure. Who do you think you are saying I to me? You nothing, you nobody, you. A body in this world drowns in it. Hey you, all our fevered history won't instill insight, won't turn a body conscious, won't make that look in the eyes say yes, though there is nothing to solve, even as each moment is an answer. Don't say I, if it means so little, hold the little, forming no one. You're not sick. You're injured. You ache for the rest of life. How to care for the injured body, the kind of body that can't hold the content it is living. And where is the safest place when that place must be someplace other than in the body? Even now, your voice entangles this mouth whose words are here as pulse, strumming, shut out, shut in, shut up. You cannot say. A body translates its you. You there. Hey, you. Even as it loses the location of its mouth. When you lay your body in the body entered as if skin and bone were public places, when you lay your body in the body entered as if you're the ground you walk on, you know no memory should live in these memories, becoming the body of you. You slow all existence down with your call, detectable only as sky. The night's yawn absorbs you as you lie down at the wrong angle to the sun ready already to let go of your hand. Wait with me. Though the waiting, wait up, might take until nothing whatsoever was done. To be left, not alone, the only wish, to call you out, to call out you. Who shouted you? You shouted you, you the murmur in the air, you sometimes sounding like you, you sometimes saying you, go nowhere, be no one, but you first. Nobody notices, only you've known. You're not sick, not crazy, not angry, not sad. It's just this, you're injured. Everything shaded, everything darkened, everything shattered. Is the stripped, is the struck, is the trace, is the aftertaste. I, they, he, we, you were too concluded yesterday to know whatever was done could also be done, was also done, was never done. The worst injury is feeling you don't belong so much to you. Thank you so much.